Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday Wellness from Trinity Health IJ Medical Group. Um, we have a few people kind of rolling in, so I will um, give a quick intro, do a little housekeeping, and then we'll get started. So again, welcome. You are um, here for Wednesday Wellness. Uh, today's topic is all about preconception, so steps to prepare for a healthy pregnancy. We have two of our OB-GYN um, providers presenting this evening. And before we get started, I just wanted to let everyone know you are all muted. Your video is off. And then we also are recording this presentation. So you will in a few days receive an email with a recording of the presentation, the presentation slides, as well as some other helpful links and resources. So look again for that to come in the next few days. So at the end of the presentation, our providers will be answering questions. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see two speech bubbles with a Q and A. If you would like to ask a question, you can type it in there anytime during the presentation. And at the end, we will address those questions. Um, please don't type them in the chat, we might miss it. So we wanna make sure we see your questions. So drop it in the correct spot there. So we are ready to get started. Um, our presenters tonight are Laura Downing and Monica Hill. They are both physicians with our obstetrics and gynecology division. Um, Dr. Hill will be presenting first. Um, she is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist. She has clinical interest in abnormal uterine bleeding, adolescent and teen care, routine and high risk pregnancy and well woman care. And Dr. Downing will present second. She is board, out, board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. She's fellowship trained in advanced pelvic surgery. She has clinical interest in managing routine and high-risk pregnancies, minimally invasive and robotic gynecological surgery, and treatments for endometriosis. So are our presenters ready to begin? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Good. Hey. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hill. Okay, and Dr. Hill, you see patients in our Westland location, correct? Correct. Okay, perfect. All right, take it away. All right, I'm Dr. Hill. I'm from IHA in Westland. Um, and I would like to talk to you today about preconception care. We're going to try to visit um, the seven topics here, optimizing chronic medical conditions, disease screening, prescription and over-the-counter medications, nutrition, fitness, and healthy habits, environmental exposure, exposures, genetic screening, and substance use in pregnancy. So are you planning to become pregnant in the next year? If so, preconception counseling is for you. The aim of pre-pregnancy care is to decrease the risk of adverse effects for the woman, the fetus, and the neonate by optimizing health, modifiable risk factors and providing education on healthy pregnancy. Pre-pregnancy care allows you and your doctor the opportunity to look at your medical history, screen for risk factors based on your family history and your lifestyle, get up to date on immunizations, optimize management of pre-existing medical conditions. Optimizing chronic medical conditions. There are several medical conditions that can adversely affect pregnancy. And the ones that we commonly see are hypertension, diabetes, thyroid disease, and mood disorders. Chronic hypertension is defined as elevated blood pressures prior to 20 weeks gestation. We refer to elevated blood pressures as 140 over 90s. Preconception counseling, for chronic hypertension aims to safely optimize blood pressure and screen for complications of long-term hypertension. Some of those complications, sorry, can you go back one? Can include kidney disease or eye disease or heart disease. Go forward, sorry. Risks of chronic hypertension in pregnancy. There are risks for mom and there's also risk for baby. Maternal risks include death, stroke, pulmonary edema, renal insufficiency or failure, myocardial infarction or heart attack, preeclampsia, placental abruption, cesarean delivery, postpartum hemorrhage, and gestational diabetes. 
for the fetus and baby, it includes stillbirth or perinatal death, growth restriction, preterm birth, and congenital anomalies, such as of the heart or the penis um, and esophagus. Some hypertensive medications to avoid in pregnancy include angiotensin receptor blockers or something called losartan. There are several different types, but that is one example. Angiotensin converting enzymes, sorry, ACE inhibitors. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Um, lisinopril is an example. How can you lower your blood pressure? So this slide actually says how to lower your blood pressure in pregnancy, but these the same things apply pre-pregnancy. Monitor your salt intake, meditate, yoga, listen to music, control your breathing, enjoy walking and regular exercise, increase your potassium intake, weight loss. Pre-gestational diabetes. Diabetes diagnosed in the first or early second trimester of pregnancy. This is diagnosed by a fasting glucose over 126 or a hemoglobin A1C greater than 6.5 or a two hour glucose greater than 200. Goals of preconception counseling. You glycemic control before and during pregnancy. So, optimizing weight and screening for complications of diabetes. So to the right, you will see some of the complications of diabetes. We screen uh, most commonly for your eye damage, your renal or kidney damage and your heart damage. Risk of pregestational diabetes. There are several risks for mom and there are several risks for babies. Among the risks are miscarriage, stillbirth, preterm labor, preeclampsia, cesarean delivery, and polyhydramnios, congenital fetal anomalies. So that's where it's really important, uh, the last one, congenital fetal anomalies, it's really important that you get your diabetes in check prior to conception to try to counteract that effect. Thyroid disease and pregnancy. Who's at risk of thyroid disease and pregnancy? Women over 30 years old, women who are morbidly obese, women with a history of pregnancy loss or preterm delivery, infertility, or someone who has a significant family history for thyroid disease, whether hypo or hyperthyroidism. Risk of thyroid disease in pregnancy include miscarriage, preeclampsia, preterm delivery, placental abruption, and fetal death. The goal of preconception care is to ensure your thyroid is supplemented or inhibited appropriately for optimal safety of you and your baby. Mood disorders. One in eight women experience depression in their lifetime. That's two times the rate of men. So we have a significant risk for being depressed at some point in our lives. Anxiety, 40% of women experience anxiety at some point in their lifetime. Who's at risk? Basically, we all are. Anyone who has anxiety, anyone who have life stressors, anyone who has a history remote or present of depression, poor social support, unintended pregnancy, or intimate partner violence. Risk of mood disorders in pregnancy include self-harm, self-neglect, impaired mother-baby bonding, relapse of bipolar depression and worsening of schizophrenia, fetal withdrawal from antidepressants. Disease screening. So throughout the pregnancy, there are certain things we screen for and the pre-pregnancy um, counseling helps us kind of pick up on some of the things that we may need to do more. But STI screenings are common, cervical cancer screening, screening is common, antibody screening and immunization uh, evaluation 
and travel precautions are all things that we screen for with preconception counseling. STD screening before and during pregnancy includes gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, HIV, hep B, and hep C. Sometimes if there is a significant risk, um, say that you were incarcerated, you lived in a shelter, you shared close quarters, we may screen for tuberculosis. Toxoplasmosis is something that we may screen for as well. Cervical cancer screening. Pap smears are completed as part of preconceptual care if, if it has not been done according to our general guidelines, which is three to five years based on what your previous pap smear was. Do you have a cat? Toxoplasmosis is um, related to cats, in particular, changing the litter box. So we do not recommend that you change the litter box. We recommend you have someone else do it. If you have no one else to do it, then you need to really wash your hands well. Sorry. <laughs> um, toxoplasmosis can also occur um, secondary to raw meats. So you wanna make sure your meats are cooked very well also. What is RH factor and why do we care? This is one of the things we screen for. We commonly say, hey, you know, we're gonna see what your blood type is. Most people say why. Well, RH is a protein that's on the surface of your, rib, of your red blood cells. If you have the protein, you're RH positive. If you do not have the protein, you're RH negative. RH incompatibility occurs when an RH mom has a RH, RH negative mom has a RH positive baby. Next. All right, so this slide basically shows we have an RH negative mom who has a baby with an RH positive father. And in the first pregnancy, nothing happens except for mom forms some antibodies, which she becomes sensitive to. And then when her second pregnancy occurs, if she's pregnant by an RH positive partner, um, it could cause antibodies that will attack the fetus as shown that picture on the far right. The antibodies, the plus symbols are attacking the baby. So it can cause things like anemia, high drops, fetal death. So we typically, if we know that you're RH negative, we screen you um, at the beginning of pregnancy and we screen you at 28 weeks and postpartum. And if you're a candidate for what's called Rogam, we give you the Rogam, which is an injection to prevent this from happening. Do you want me to keep going? Um, I'm just gonna switch over if that's okay. Sounds Thanks, good. Dr. Hill. Um, hi guys, my name is Laura Downing. I'm one of the um, OBGYNs. I work both um, at the Chelsea location and also at the West Arbor office um, over on Jackson Road. Um, and just for confusion's sake, I did get married recently and changed my name from Roosh to Downing. So. Um, if you see the name Roosh, it's the same person. Some of the um, marketing stuff so still says Roosh. So um, nice to meet y'all virtually. Um, so I was just going to start by mentioning vaccinations um, before pregnancy. Um, so it is really important. There's a few diseases that it is important to screen for um, or know that you're vaccinated against prior to pregnancy. So a couple things specifically. Um, so var varicella is, um, that's the chicken pox virus, um, can also cause shingles, um, and rubella, which is like German measles. Um, those two viruses can um, cause serious problems during pregnancy, including congenital anomalies, um, and they're both preventable by vaccine. So those are two um, vaccines that if you are not sure if you're um, immune to those, you could get your antibodies checked before pregnancy and get, the, get up to date with those two vaccines. Um, those two cannot be given during pregnancy because they're live virus vaccines. Um, and so we really only give inactivated vaccines during pregnancy. Um, you also really want to make sure that you're um, up to date with your hepatitis vaccines. Hepatitis can be transmitted to babies during pregnancy and can cause severe problems um, during pregnancy and also for the child as they um, grow older. Um, HPV is a, is a virus that can lead to cervical cancer in some women. So if you've been, not been vaccinated against HPV, um, 
it's great to do so. It's usually, um, nowadays we're giving it to girls who are like young, usually the pediatricians are giving it before the age of 11, um, but it is actually FDA approved up to age 45. So if you um, didn't get it when you were younger, you can definitely talk to your primary care, your OBGYN about the HPV vaccine um, and get that. Um, the flu shot and the COVID vaccine, we definitely recommend both of those two things. Um, you can actually get those either before or during pregnancy, um, whenever, you know, wherever you're falling in terms of flu season. Um, and then during pregnancy, the vaccines that we give include the Tdap vaccine, which is um, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Um, and mostly that's for the pertussis, which is whooping cough. Um, babies can get really sick from that. And so when you get vaccinated, when you're pregnant, you can pass those antibodies through the placenta to the baby um, and give the baby some protection. Pregnant women who get sick with the flu or COVID-19 or COVID-19 are definitely more at risk um, compared to women who are not pregnant for severe illness and hospitalization. So um, definitely good to, to stay up to date with those vaccinations. Um, so COVID-19, I know we're all probably tired of hearing about it, um, but COVID um, vaccines, um, we do have a lot of data now to say that it is safe to get a COVID-19 vaccine during pregnancy, including boosters, um, as well as during breastfeeding. Um, if you have not been vaccinated at all, I would recommend just getting a vaccine ASAP. Um, if you have been vaccinated and are wondering about booster shots, um, I think that's just good to talk with your provider. Some of you know the timing of when to get a booster shot is going to depend a little bit on, I think, the state of the virus, um, you know, outbreaks, um, kind of what it looks like in your community. But it's safe to get boosters during pregnancy. We've had studies that look at um, you know, fertility concerns, miscarriage risk, um, and we've not seen any adverse pregnancy effects from the vaccine. Um, but definitely um, during the pandemic, we've had many pregnant women who have had to be hospitalized and needing to be um, in critical care um, with COVID-19 infections. And so we really want to protect um, you and your baby. COVID can increase the risk of um, miscarriage and stillbirth, um, as well as low birth rate. If you do happen to get COVID in pregnancy, um, first know that you're not alone. It's very common. Um, unfortunately, even with women who have been vaccinated and or boosted, we're starting to see, um, you know, there's definitely some people who are still getting COVID even though they've been vaccinated. Um, most of those women are not getting severe disease and have really great pregnancy outcomes. So um, just let your OBGYN know if you get COVID. Um, we can talk to you about some of the additional screening we do, which is mostly just an extra ultrasound to make sure your baby's growing well. Um, so Zika, I do get questions about this prior to pregnancy. Um, Zika, you may, you may remember, is a um, virus that's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, and it was in the news a lot, like in 2015, 2016, uh, because there was wide outbreaks in South America and Brazil. Um, and moms were having pregnancies affected by Zika where the baby's um, brain uh, had decreased brain development and what's called microcephaly or small head, small brain um, and other negative pregnancy outcomes. Um, thankfully, since that time, Zika um, has become less of a concern. Um, actually in the last about three years in the United States, there has not been any transmission of Zika within the continental United States. Um, there have been a small number of people who have tested positive for Zika, but those are people who have traveled to areas where um, Zika is still prevalent. Um, there's no actual active like outbreaks um, internationally right now. Um, but if you're thinking about traveling during pregnancy, I just really strongly encourage you to look at the CDC website because it does change um, you know, week to week, month to month. Um, and it has a nice map on there, kind of shows you different countries and uh, what the recommendations are specifically for travel to that area. Um, sometimes, you know, if Brazil, for example, if you were to go there, they recommend waiting like two months prior to pregnancy. Um, the other thing about Zika is that it can be transmitted through sperm. So it can be transmitted sexually. Um, so if your partner is traveling um, before or during pregnancy, also important to look at those guidelines based on where he's going um, and make sure that you're following them. And there is no um, 
there's no vaccine for Zika, there's no treatment for Zika. So it's really about prevention. Um, and just like with any other mosquito-borne illness, um, you know, we do recommend using bug spray, wearing long sleeves if you're in a mosquito heavy um, environment. Um, so prescriptions and over-the-counter medications, this is something that um, any of my patients who are thinking about becoming pregnant, we just like to take a quick look through your med list and make sure you're not on anything that could be harmful during pregnancy. Um, there, I kind of listed some kind of um, medications that we really see as red flags, um, medications to avoid during pregnancy. Um, the ones that are most common um, for potentially causing um, like birth defects are um, some certain blood pressure medications that we would mentioned earlier, like ACE inhibitors, um, some seizure medications, um, Accutane, which is like an acne medication, lithium, a couple other ones you can see listed there. Um, if you're on any of those medications, really important that you are on great contraception. Um, and if you're thinking about becoming pregnant, you want to be off of those things before, before you try to conceive. Um, I definitely see a lot of women who just like find out they're pregnant or think about becoming pregnant and just completely stop all medications. And we definitely don't recommend that. Um, if you, you know, if you need to be on something or you need to be on medication for a certain disease, it's important to do so. That includes mental health um, disorders and mood medications. Um, and so before you just completely stop something, make sure to just talk to your OBGYN about it. Prenatal vitamins are recommended to start before you try to conceive. Um, there are a million out there on the market and I do get a lot of questions about which ones are the best ones. Um, and what I would say is uh, just don't spend a lot of money on a prenatal vitamin. Really all you need is a generic over-the-counter prenatal that has at least 400 micrograms of folic acid in it, um, as well as iron. Um, and pretty much all uh, prenatal vitamins are gonna have that in there. Um, but keep in mind, prenatal vitamins are not FDA regulated. Um, there's a lot of marketing around them. And I think, um, you know, again, you don't need to buy anything fancy or expensive with that. Um, there are certain populations who need a little bit higher folic acid um, than just the 400 micrograms. Um, so people who have like twin pregnancies um, or take certain medications. Um, so again, your OBGYN can talk to you about that. Um, with caffeine intake, so if you're a super heavy caffeine drinker, um, I would recommend weaning down prior to thinking about pregnancy. So, you know, you don't have to go through that terrible caffeine withdrawal. Um, as far as what amount is safe in pregnancy, so right now the recommendation is um, 200 micrograms or less, or milligrams of, or less of caffeine. So um, that's about um, like two cups of coffee um, and two, like eight ounce cups of coffee, not two grande coffee, it's from Starbucks. Um, although even, you know, even with caffeine last year, there was a study, um, that came out from the National Institute of Health that did show that even low doses of caffeine below that 200 milligrams um, were associated with um, babies that were a little bit smaller than women who did not have caffeine intake during pregnancy. And so that sort of raised the question is even, even small doses of caffeine, could that be affecting the health of the placenta and blood vessels um, in the placenta? And so, um, you know, it's really hard to do great studies on every medication or environmental um, exposure in pregnancy and say, you know, wh exactly what's causing what. But um, in general, if you can avoid medications you don't need or substances you don't need, always great to do so. Um, and then same thing for over-the-counter medications. This is kind of a list of some common over-the-counter medications that people ask about. Um, Again, if you, if you don't need something, don't take it. But if you are having, you know, really bad constipation or really bad cold symptoms, there are absolutely things that are okay to take. So um, don't be afraid to ask. Don't feel like you can't take anything. Um, you know, acid reflux during pregnancy is so common and we have lots of great medications for that. Um, so don't feel like you have to suffer with nothing. Um, Tylenol is the one that's recommended for pain control. So we don't recommend any ibuprofen or, or Motrin, Aleve, those NSAID medications. Um, but Tylenol is definitely considered um, safe for pregnancy. Um, again, I would not take more than you need, but on days if you have a bad headache or something like that, it's totally fine to take Tylenol. Um, yep. 
Um, so fitness and healthy habits, this is definitely something that I am uh, super passionate about. Um, I think um, just the way that our whole society is structured, it's like we really have to be, um, you know, you have to be cognizant about physical activity because we are all just sitting at our desks on our computers every day and driving everywhere. And, you know, it's hard, it's hard to get an exercise, but it's definitely something important to think about, especially if you're um, going to become pregnant. So healthy weight. So an ideal BMI, which is a body mass index, um, is between 18.5 and 25. Uh, a BMI between 25 and 30 is considered overweight, and then a BMI over 30 is considered obese. Um, it is best if you can get down to sort of that, um, if your weight is too low to get up to a BMI of 18.5 or higher, and if your weight is too high to try to get down. Um, you know, that being said, you know, if your BMI is 35, you don't have to wait until you have a BMI of 25 to get pregnant. But even a five to 10% reduction in body weight can make a really big impact on pregnancy outcomes. Um, we know that women who are underweight or women who are obese um, actually have um, more fertility issues. Um, and so sometimes um, just increasing physical activity and some weight loss can help, um, can help you become pregnant in the first place. Um, there's definitely a lot of adverse pregnancy um, outcomes that are associated with being underweight or being obese. Um, and so some of those things include higher risk of miscarriage, um, uh, fetal anomalies, um, increased risk of preterm delivery. Um, with women who are obese, we know they definitely have a higher risk of gestational diabetes um, and gest gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, um, as well as developing blood clots in the legs or lungs, um, which can be a serious and can be fatal for patients. Um, with physical activity, so prior to pregnancy and actually during pregnancy, we do recommend um, physical activity pretty similar to like a general population. Um, and so the recommendation, if you can do it, is about 150 minutes per week of moderate exercise. So that's about 30 minutes, um, five times a day. And it's not that you have to do 30 minutes all at once. You can break that down into a little 10 minute chunks if that's easier for your lifestyle. Um, but trying to keep track of that, um, you know, little things I think that you can work into your life, like increasing your steps or trying to take the stairs instead of an elevator, but just little things that you can build into your lifestyle that's already set um, to increase physical activity. Um, people ask me all the time about pregnancy, what they can do during pregnancy as far as physical activity. Um, most things are still safe. Um, you know, the things that I don't recommend is things like downhill skiing or skateboarding, things that are, you have a higher risk of injury, um, but you can and should increase, um, continue to be physically active as long as it's not painful. Um, and generally, I don't want you to be um, working out to the point that you feel like you're out of breath or, um, you know, you're getting like super hot. We don't want your temperature getting crazy high or passing out, that sort of thing. Um, so nutrition, nutrition is so important and it's, um, it's so ironic that we live in a country that has, um, you know, we're one of the wealthiest countries in the world and have access to so many foods. And unfortunately, the foods that are the easiest to access are often the foods that are the lowest in nutrients um, and the highest in calorie and sort of those empty calories. Um, and so the recommendation for nutrition prior to pregnancy is pretty similar to what I would talk to anybody about. Um, so kind of like a good rule of thumb when you're going grocery shopping is to try to eat the foods that are on the perimeter of the grocery store as opposed to all those foods that are prepackaged um, and inside the aisles. Um, and so a diet, um, you want a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, um, whole grains as opposed to simple carbs or heavily processed foods. Um, nuts are great, great source of protein and healthy fats. Um, legumes, so things like beans, those are really high in fiber um, and have a high glycemic index. Um, seafood, we'll talk about that in the next slide, but that is um, actually recommended to get seafood um, in pregnancy. Um, and then vegetable oils are great and um, generally healthier than like your saturated fats. Um, avoiding added sugars, um, refined grains. Um, so, you know, things like um, 
you know, crackers and cookies and chips, those things that are heavily processed with a lot of added salt and sugar. Um, and then red and processed meats, um, not to say that you can't do that, but you just want to limit your red and processed meats because they do tend to be higher in saturated fat and cholesterol um, and tend to have added, um, added compounds in them, things like nitrites um, that are, you know, preservatives to help prevent infection in the meat, but can increase the risk of cancers and other heart problems. Um, and even what you eat before pregnancy can affect um, the health of your baby. And so this was just one study that came out um, a couple of, I think it was like two years ago, um, but did show that a mother's diet even before pregnancy can affect um, the baby's health after birth. And so things like the baby's immune system, the baby's risk of developing obesity as they get older um, or developing diabetes. Um, and so when you're pregnant, you're definitely, I just think that everything that you eat is going to your baby through the placenta. All the baby's nutrients are coming through you. So it is really important to set that healthy start for your baby. Um, seafood in pregnancy. So seafood is um, recommended. Um, seafood is a really great source of protein and it does have lots of those omega-3 fatty acids, which are um, helpful for a baby's brain development um, and eye development as well. Um, the recommendation is to eat two to three servings per week, um, which is eight to 12 ounces in total um, of a variety of different types of fish. Um, in the next slide, we'll kind of talk about which, um, which fish are the best options. Um, the thing that you have to watch out with um, with seafood is um, mercury content. So some fish have higher mercury contents than others. Um, mercury is okay in a really small dose, but you just want to stay in that safe range. So this is... Um, from the FDA. And if you are not sure about what fish you're eating, you can always go to their website. They have great resources for nutrition. Um, but some of the best fish choices are the ones that are easiest to find, thankfully. But um, fish like salmon, um, tilapia, shrimp, canned tuna, um, those are sort of on the best choice list. So those are the fish that are lower in mercury, um, mercury concentration. And then you want to avoid those ones that are in orange. Um, things like swordfish, um, king mackerel, that sort of thing. Would be hard to find those things in Michigan. Um, environmental exposure. So um, I do try to talk to my patients about this. I think um, there are so many chemicals that we are exposed to in our environment that um, are really pretty new if you think about it. Like, you know, certain, we just have way more chemicals in our environment than we had, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago for sure. And I think that the data on some of these environmental exposures is um, kind of new and there's gonna be a lot more to come about this. Kind of like I mentioned before, it's really hard sometimes to link an environmental exposure to a pregnancy outcome or a health concern because there's so many confounding factors um, that can go into that. Um, but um, there are definitely sort of rules of thumb that you can do to try to limit your exposure to chemicals and other um, potential toxic things in your environment. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through a couple of things, but plastics, um, we know that plastics can be harmful. They can um, disrupt your endocrine system, um, especially plastics with BPA or um, bisphenol A. Um, so look for plastics that um, don't have BPA in them. Um, for sure, if you're, if you're, you know, cooking a dinner and wanting to put leftovers in the fridge, um, if you put something in plastic, don't heat it up in the plastic, you want to put it onto a plate, or even better, if you can just store it in like a glass container or a non-plastic container, that's great. Um, uh, fertilizers, um, pesticides, those sorts of things, if you're um, fortunate enough to be able to do organic um, food, that is great to avoid fertilizers. Um, if you work with any of that stuff in your job, um, you definitely want to wear rubber gloves, wash your hands with warm soap and water afterwards. Um, chemicals that you're using in your house, like cleaners, um, same thing, wear rubber gloves, um, open up the windows if you're using sprays, that sort of thing. Um, there are great um, like homemade cleaners that you can use that have fewer chemicals in them. So things um, just using... Um, you know, like baking soda or vinegar um, is a good choice. But whenever you can, try to look for um, cleaning solutions that have like fewer chemicals or, or um, you know, more natural products. Lead paint and asbestos. So those are things 
in your house, um, especially if you live in an older home, you just want to make sure that, that you have, um, you're, you're not getting any lead paint exposure in your house, um, as well as asbestos. Mercury, kind of like we talked about, fish is definitely the biggest, um, the biggest one that uh, causes mercury exposure. Um, a couple other things that are listed on here is um, dry cleaning. You know, I think there um, there are some chemicals in dry uh, dry cleaning. So perchloroethylene is one um, that actually can be that has been linked to negative um, health effects from dry cleaning. Um, probably if you dry clean once in a while, it's okay. If you work at a dry cleaner, you're wearing dry clean clothes every day. Um, I would not recommend that during pregnancy, um, but you know you can certainly look into your specific dry cleaners and see what they, what kind of chemicals they use. Um, trying to use like fragrance-free products, um, even like uh, makeup or anything that you're putting on your face or your body, um, you want to just kind of like look at the ingredients, use stuff that's um, safe for pregnancy. Um, so substance use. Um, I just want to start by saying that substance use is very common, and if you are having any concerns that you are um, struggling with substance use of any kind, please do not hesitate to reach out to your doctor. We absolutely are here to help you, not to judge you, um, and we want to connect you to any resources um, that we can to help you um, be um, free of your substance use. Um, and so these are sort of the common ones that are listed there, but tobacco, alcohol, marijuana, um, other illegal drugs, and as well as prescription drugs that are taken for non-medical reason. Um, all of those things can cause serious problems in pregnancy, like birth defects, low birth weight, preterm birth, stillbirth. Um, smoking is really harmful in pregnancy. It, it really affects the placenta. When we deliver a baby to a mom who smokes and that placenta comes out, it just looks completely different than a healthy pregnancy. Um, and so all my pregnant patients who smoke, we talk about it multiple times during pregnancy. Um, I totally prescribe like nicotine patches. There's lots of other like community resources I can connect you with to help you stop smoking during pregnancy. Additionally, if your partner smokes, um, you know, secondhand, expo secondhand smoke exposure can also be harmful in pregnancy. And certainly um, that can get into like fabrics and clothes and things in your house. And then after the baby's born, that can be um, harmful to your baby. Um, marijuana is what I get asked about a lot. There's not a ton of data yet on marijuana in use in pregnancy, but we are getting more and more data on that. And there are um, harmful effects of marijuana use in pregnancy, including um, like neurodevelopmental issues um, with babies. And so um, I really just strongly discourage it, even though um, it's so easy to access now. Um, also, it does have some of the, some of the similar effects with the placenta as um, tobacco can have. Alcohol is one of the most dangerous toxins that you can use in pregnancy. And we know that there's no safe level of alcohol use in pregnancy. Um, alcohol can have severe effects to the fetus, um, including birth defects, learning, learning delays, and all sorts of things. Um, if you are trying to become pregnant, um, I generally recommend to avoid alcohol use. Um, you know, that being said, most people who come to me pregnant, many of them didn't realize they were pregnant at the very beginning of a pregnancy and may have had a couple of drinks early on, and that's okay. Um, but definitely as soon as you find out you're pregnant, um, would avoid alcohol use. Um, it can also affect your fertility and it can affect male fertility as well. So if you're having trouble conceiving, try to reduce or cut out your alcohol consumption. So for genetic screening, um, there are a few diseases specifically. Um, genetic screening is kind of a really big topic for pregnancy and it does open up a whole can of worms um, with genetic screening. But if you are at all interested in preconception genetic testing, uh, please talk to your OBGYN. There's a few disorders um, specifically which are recommended to be offered to all pregnant patients. Um, and so that includes something called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, which is a um, sort of a spinal cord disorder that affects um, motor neurons or muscle nerves for babies and can lead to skeletal problems. Um, and is one of the, it's actually the most common genetic cause of infant death. Cystic fibrosis is a disease that it can affect um, a person's lungs um, and their pancreas. Um, it is a very severe disease. Um, 
you know, and many people who are a carrier of SMA or cystic fibrosis may not know that. And then, you know, if your partner is also a carrier of those two things, um, you guys have a one in four chance of having a baby who is affected by one of those syndromes. So um, most insurances are covering um, genetic screening for those two disorders prior to pregnancy. So if you've not been screened, it's definitely a great idea just to uh, talk to your doctor about that. Hemoglobinopathy. So what that is, is things like sickle cell disease or thalassemias. Um, for sure, if you have any family history of that, I would recommend getting tested. Um, and all pregnant patients are kind of screened for that with a blood count at the beginning. And then if you have a low blood count in the beginning of your pregnancy, then we can talk about testing your hemoglobin, which is part of the blood cells. If you have any other like family um, history of like specific genetic syndromes or diseases or rare things. Super great to bring it up to your doctor ahead of time. Um, you know, in extreme circumstances, if there's a disease that's, uh, you know, really bad, you can actually um, even, some people even do like in vitro fertilization, which is um, like fertility treatment. And you can actually nowadays um, screen embryos for whether they have a specific disease prior to even getting pregnant. And so obviously those are very specific scenarios, but um, there are treatments and options out there. If you've had like a baby affected or you have a strong family history. Um, and then how long should you wait in between pregnancies? So, you know, this is um, kind of a generalized guideline, but I do recommend an ACOG, which is like OBGYN association recommends that pregnant women wait 18 months in between pregnancies. And so that means from the time your baby delivers until you become pregnant again, that should be an 18 month gap. Um, and why is that such a long wait? Well, um, a bunch of reasons, but pregnancy is a really tough um, time on your body. Your body goes through a lot of changes um, and it needs time to recover for sure. Um, it's also, we want you to have time to focus on your newborn um, before, you know, having a second child. Um, a lot of women are going to, every woman is going to gain weight during pregnancy. And it does usually take significant time for you to get back to your pre-pregnancy weight. Um, and, you know, if you go into a next pregnancy with a normal weight, you're going to have better outcomes. Um, we know that shorter intervals in between pregnancies are associated with preterm birth and lower birth weight. Um, now, the caveat with this, there are specific scenarios where I might encourage a patient to think about a shorter interval. Um, and so the main one for that is with older patients. Um, fertility, um, you know, is a spectrum. Everybody's different with that. But for many women, fertility is going to significantly decline in your mid-30s. And so, you know, if you're having your first baby at 35, you might not want to wait 18 months before your second baby. Um, and I think that's just a specific conversation that you'd want to have with your OBGYN about what, um, what they recommend for you specifically. Um, and then this is just kind of a slide. This is, this is me, Laura Downing. Um, I, like I mentioned, I'm at those two offices, both in Chelsea um, and at West Arbor on Jackson Road. It was nice to meet y'all. And this is me. I am Dr. Hill from OB. I'm an OBGYN at IHA in Westland, uh, 32932 Warren Road. And if you'd like to, I'd love to have you. Um, thank you both, Dr. Downey and Dr. Hill. Um, so we do have several questions if you guys would like to um, take a few minutes to answer. And again, if you have a question, for Dr. Downing or Dr. Hill, you can place it in the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And um, I also want to mention that we will be sending a recording of the presentation as well as um, a link to the slides that, the, that they presented this evening. And you should receive that in your email in the coming days. Um, and we'll also have a link to our OBGYN specialty page um, so if you don't live in the Ann Arbor, Chelsea area or the Westlead area, we have several locations all over. Um, so we, you will definitely be able to find an OBGYN that would be accepting new patients. Okay. So let's start with, so you mentioned um, back in the beginning of the presentation, you talked about some of the pre-screening. So is it required to be screened for an STD if this is, as she put it, a homebody and only have one partner? 
<laughs> so traditionally, we always screen for HIV and syphilis and hepatitis B and C. Regardless, we can't always say you may be faithful to your partner, your partner may not be faithful to you. We have to make sure, like, for instance, HIV is something that can be transmitted to your baby. So we would like to exclude you having HIV so that we can try to prevent it from being transmitted by giving you certain medications. Syphilis can also be transmitted congenitally to your baby. So we like to make sure certain things are not there. Now you could talk to your provider in terms of like gonorrhea or chlamydia. You could skip those if your provider and you are both comfortable. But HIV, syphilis, hep B and hep C are pretty standard. Okay, so we talked a lot about different types of medications that are safe to take during pregnancy. And I know you mentioned anxiety and depression medications. Are there specific ones you can think of? I'm sure that's a conversation um, to have with your patient directly, but just kind of off the top of your head, is there a general um, rule? We typically use a lot of Zoloft um, and Bruce Farr at our practice. What about you? Can't hear you. Sorry, I would agree with that. Um, Zoloft is probably the medication that we're most commonly using in terms of that, what's called SSRI um, group of medications, but other, other medications that fall into that category, like um, Lexapro, Effexor, um, Prozac, those things. Um, again, we don't have great robust data on to say that they're a thousand percent safe, but I can tell you lots of pregnant patients who use those medications. Um, and if you need them, we know that untreated anxiety and depression um, can have adverse effects on babies for sure. And so it's a risk benefit, but um, I feel like most of the time um, patients who would have been on it prior to pregnancy are probably going to continue to need it. Um, and certainly in the postpartum period, if you have any history of pre-existing anxiety or depression, that's going to be exacerbated when you're you know, sleep deprived and have a newborn at home. So it is good to make sure those things are being treated or at least addressed um, during and after pregnancy. I typically talk to patients around 34 to 36 weeks who have a history of depression. If they're not taking anything during the pregnancy and encourage them to restart for the fear of postpartum depression or anxiety. So it's something to talk about with your provider. Excellent. So you talked about the COVID booster. So I think we're almost to a time where we're ready to talk about second boosters. Is that something that you're recommending to um, women who are thinking of getting pregnant or who might already be pregnant? So generally speaking, yes, I do recommend the COVID booster um, in areas where there's a lot of COVID. If there's a decline in the amount of COVID in your community, then you may want to wait to get your booster at a time where the levels of COVID have accelerated again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's a hard, it's hard because it's like, if you have already, if you've already been vaccinated and certainly if you've been boosted once, you have really good protection against severe disease already. Um, but we know that, especially as COVID has mutated and changed over time, um, the current vaccines that we have seem to not be quite as effective for as long. Um, and so, you know, and that might change. I know they're working on making new vaccines. Um, it'll probably be like the flu shot where they're going to have, you know, updated vaccines every year or every other year or whatever. Um, but it's good to get a booster when it's going to be most effective for you because it's probably only going to last for so many months. And so um, just as I would say, it's kind of depends on when you had your first booster. So I talked to you about and about your specific um, scenario. Perfect. Thank you. So you talked about prenatal vitamins and folic acid. So somebody is asking, one, is it there too much? Um, is there such a thing as too much folic acid? And what would that look like? And then how long should you take the prenatal vitamins? So they're called prenatal, but should they extend even through um, after delivery? Yeah, yep. So um, to my knowledge, I don't think there's too much folic acid that you can take. Um, actually, so we recommend 400 micrograms for most women. Um, but there are some women that we actually recommend four milligrams, which is like, is that 10 times or hundred times more, <laughs> but a lot more. Um, so 
Um, I don't think that, because usually with most vitamins, your body is going to excrete, like if you get way too much of a vitamin, your body's going to excrete that. Um, and do you recommend taking prenatal vitamins? And the, and the folic acid, I just want to mention, the main reason that we recommend that is to prevent neural tube defects. Most of those are going to happen in the first, like, you know, before even eight weeks, even before six weeks. And so that's why we really recommend that you start those before pregnancy. Now, thankfully, those are very rare um, diseases of pregnancy because we, a lot of us are getting folic acid in our diet as well. Um, but many women don't even realize that they're pregnant by the time that a lot of these structures are already formed. And so it's important to start before. And then I recommend continuing um, all while you're breastfeeding. I agree with that. Excellent. So if you're trying to get pregnant and maybe you're um, taking birth control, is there a recommended amount of time to be off of your pill or your birth control um, to increase the chances of conception? So everybody's body is going to be a little bit different. For instance, somebody may get their next one on out or their Mirena out and may have six months before they ovulate and conceive. And another person may get pregnant in two weeks. So it just sort of varies. I think if you're going to stop your contraception with plans of, on getting pregnant, you should start your prenatal vitamin right away mm -hmm. with the thought process that it can happen at any time. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Um, and most of the time, especially like birth control pills, um, I guess what I would say is there, there's no birth control that's harmful to your baby. So if you are taking a birth control pill and you miss some pills, you get pregnant, you don't realize it. And, you know, having taken pills for the first few weeks, is not going to cause harm to your baby. Um, and the other thing is a lot of people, I mean, assuming you don't have any underlying ovulatory issues or fertility issues, a lot of women are going to have that first ovulation within a month after coming off their pill. So make sure if you're going to stop your pill or get your IUD taken out or your next one taken out, um, that you're ready to be pregnant within a month, because a lot of times that's, that's how quickly it may happen. But don't get too nervous if it's six months, because sometimes yeah. <laughs> the longer acting contraceptions can delay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. So there are several questions about working out. So we'll start off with, is it safe to work out all the way through the third trimester? Yes. It is safe to work out all the way through pregnancy. I do put a limit um, after 20 weeks to 20 pounds of heavy you know, weightlifting, but aerobic type exercise is welcome throughout the pregnancy. Squatting is great. It helps with delivery. So being active in general actually helps with your delivery process. It helps maintain a healthy weight and diabetic control and blood pressure control. So yes, we encourage it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally agree. Um, I would say recommended and encouraged. Now that being said, you're you're not going to be you know when you're 35 weeks pregnant, you're not going to be able to do the same type of exercise that you did you know before you were pregnant. Um, and you know pain and all the stretching of muscles and ligaments and things that happens with pregnancy might limit your function to some degree. Um, and you know the other thing I just warn people about if you're like do, you know. Um, jogging or that sort of thing, just keeping in mind that you're really minimizing any risk of falls because um, your center of gravity is so different when you're pregnant. Um, but as long as you're not having pain with something, um, it is fine and safe to do. Um, I do tell people like if you were just a complete couch potato prior to pregnancy and then you get pregnant, you want to be all healthy, don't go like sign up for a marathon. <laughs> um, but just, you know, gentle kind of build up to similar to what you were doing before, if you weren't doing anything before, just kind of build up slowly. Okay, so someone did actually ask about high intensity workouts. So that is still okay to do in pregnancy, during pregnancy, as long as that's something you did prior to becoming pregnant? So ACOG put a statement out in 2017 that went against doing HIT in pregnancy. So I would have to support that. Yeah, I, th I think, um, I think it just really depends on like what it is. Um, so in the beginning of pregnancy, one concern is I don't want people to get super, super hot because temperature can actually affect the baby. Um, in the first half of pregnancy, your blood pressure can actually be an issue. So people are more at risk of like fainting 
Um, you might just notice that things that you could tolerate before you just cannot handle. Um, you know, we don't want anything that's really lowering your blood sugar like crazy or like your heart rate's getting like way up for an extended period of time. But I do have patients that do like CrossFit as an example. Um, I have patients that are long distance runners during pregnancy. And as long as, um, like I said, I don't want you to be working out to the point you really can't have a conversation and you're like completely out of breath. Um, if it, you're just kind of doing gentle stuff um, and like moderate aerobic ac activity, that's okay. Okay, excellent. So with that, does that, what are your thoughts on BMI during pregnancy? Because obviously it's maybe a little bit different. So is there a Can you repeat that for me? I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Um, is there a different BMI range that you should be shooting for when you're pregnant? Um, does it change at all from prior to becoming pregnant? Is there a certain number you should stay, you know, under when you're actually pregnant? So typically we use your pre-pregnancy BMI to make recommendations on how much weight you should gain in the pregnancy. So it's not necessarily the BMI ranges changes. It's more so what your pre-pregnancy weight should dictate where your BMI lies while pregnant, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't really like we don't really talk about BMI so much in pregnancy because obviously, you know, it's different, but we look more at your pre-pregnancy BMI, like Dr. Hill was saying, and then, and then advise how much weight you should gain. Um, we don't want anybody to be losing weight during pregnancy. Um, now that being said, sometimes people lose a little bit of weight in the first trimester, just because you may be not able to eat a normal diet um, and having issues with nausea and vomiting and a small amount of weight gain in the first trimester. Um, is okay as long as you're talking to your doctor about that. That's not going to cause harm to your baby. Um, but we don't want anybody doing like crash diets during pregnancy or really trying to like lose a bunch of weight during pregnancy, um, even if you're starting out pregnancy at an obese category. Okay, excellent. So in terms of diet, if you are a vegan, can you consume seaweed instead of seafood um, during pregnancy? Um, yeah, you can, you can con consume seaweed. Um, I don't think that seaweed, you know, the main um, benefit of fish is those omega-3 fatty acids, which um, I don't think seaweed is going to have that. Um, but um, it is definitely possible to be vegetarian and or vegan during pregnancy and have a completely healthy pregnancy. You, um, you know, most people who are vegan are going to know about those extra supplements they might need. So vitamin B12 is a big one. Um, and you can take, um, like fish oil supplements as an example. I mean, there's not great data to show, you know, is that, is that similar to eating fish or not, but that's probably what I would recommend. Um, but yeah, most, most people are vegan or eating tons of fruits and vegetables. So your diet is probably even better than the average person. I agree. Excellent. So someone is asking about. Um, a hernia. So, and I'm going to mispronounce it. You'll have to forgive me, but an inguinal hernia. And would that make a vaginal birth difficult? I haven't seen it complicate any vaginal deliveries. How about you? I have not. No. Um, yeah. I mean, I think if you have something like that, that's bothering you, it's probably um, good to talk to a surgeon, a general surgeon is going to be the person who's going to fix that. You might want to talk to somebody before you think about conceiving just to get their opinion on that um, or see if they're, you know, it's a, it's a minor outpatient procedure usually to get those fixed. So um, if you could get that taken care of prior to pregnancy, it might be, might be better, but I've, I have not seen anybody with issues with that with pregnancy. And just know that if you are currently pregnant, they're not going to fix the inguinal hernia mm -hmm. during your pregnancy. So if it's something that is really bothering you, you probably want to get it taken care of prior to pregnancy. Yeah. yeah. Most surgeries, um, unless it's really like, you know, like an emergency. Brittany. Yeah. they most surgeons are going to be like, we'll take care of that afterwards. So. Okay. So how about MRIs? Can you have an MRI during pregnancy? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. If it's medically necessary, we don't use the contrast for it. Okay. Perfect. Um, so we have a couple questions about, uh, getting pregnant at 40. So are there risks? And I know you mentioned 35 was sort of where you start to consider it a high risk. So what are those risks? Is there anything that can be done to kind of help um, 
to like mitigate some of those risks? You go first. Um, yeah, so there definitely are risks associated with being older at time of conception. So um, I think the number one thing to be aware of is that at age 40, many women are going to really struggle with getting pregnant in the first place. Um, so, you know, just knowing that a lot of women are going to re require fertility treatments, not everybody. Um, and even with fertility treatments, pregnancy can be really difficult to achieve at age 40. Um, the miscarriage rate, unfortunately, is also much higher at age 40 compared to somebody who's, say, age 30. Um, and a lot of that has to do with egg quality. Um, we're all born with the total number of eggs that we have in May age. And no matter how healthy you are, how great your diet is, you exercise your eggs, um, you really have no control over fertility, unfortunately. Um, specific risks of like um, being older during pregnancy. So um, we know there's like higher risk of developing um, preeclampsia and blood pressure problems, gestational diabetes. Um, I mentioned the much higher risk of miscarriage. Um, and um, most pregnancy complications honestly are higher. And a lot of that too is that people at age 40, certainly not everybody, but more often at age 40, people are going to have some of those pre-existing medical problems that we mentioned, like high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, but if you're a healthy 40 year old, um, I, I definitely don't like discourage pregnancy. Just want to make sure you have any medical problems managed beforehand. And being over 40, we um, typically do a little bit more screening um, of the fetus to make sure the fetus is fine, like growth restriction can occur. So we'll get frequent, more frequent ultrasounds and we may possibly do stress tests um, mm -hmm. on your baby. Um, did you say anything about genetics? I yeah, I didn't. That was the other thing I didn't mention. Yeah, so we would also recommend genetic screening. Like for younger, healthier women, we may not push the issue with genetic screening, but women over 35, especially 40, 45, we typically would recommend some genetic screening be completed in the pregnancy because you would be at higher risk for say having a Downs baby compared to a young, healthy female. Okay, so we talk about preconception screening um, for, um, for like genetics, is that covered by insurance? And is it possible to have men um, screened as well? So, 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 go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say it often is covered by insurance. It depends on what it is. Um, and like I mentioned, there's kind of specific diseases that we recommend screening for, but what we don't recommend screening for is sort of doing like a broad panel. Um, there's actually been a lot of news recently about preconception, uh, preconception genetic testing. Um, there's like companies out there that will offer like doing like a whole DNA panel and coming up with all sorts of potential you know, genetic syndromes that you may or may not have or be at risk for. And a lot of that stuff is just not well understood and um, can lead to unnecessary anxiety. Um, and companies are making money off of that. And so sometimes with genetics, it's sort of like we, ha we have the power of testing stuff that we don't, we have like too much information. We don't know what to do with it. So before you consider anything, I definitely talk to your doctor about what's recommended. Um, but for those specific diseases that I mentioned, most insurance companies are covering that. Um, you'd always want to check before that's ordered. And usually that's just like a quick phone call to your insurance company. Um, and then for testing men, it depends. I mean, so like as an example, cystic fibrosis, you can both be tested for that. Um, but usually what I recommend is just having, you know, the female tested first. And then if you're not a carrier, um, even if your husband is a carrier, there's no chance that your fetus could be affected because you have to both be carriers in order to pass that on. And there are other diseases that that's not the case. You could have one person who's a carrier and the baby could be affected, um, but those diseases are less common and you probably know about it with your family history. I agree. So does that apply to STDs too then in terms of testing men? Does what apply to STDs? So or, should or the, the, yeah, should the female be tested? So um, typically versus, it is the female. Um, okay. As the OBGYN, we typically have limited interaction with a male par partner. Um, I mean, they come for the prenatal visits if they desire, but there's no treatment or management of them per se. We only manage the females. Okay. 
<clears throat> and things like herpes and HPV, you touched on them in the presentation, but those are STDs that can harm the baby or be passed on to the baby. So herpes is generally not a screen screening test per se, but if you have signs or symptoms, we will test you for herpes. And yes, herpes can be transmitted um, to the fetus. However, if we know that you have herpes, say you're in labor, you have a history of herpes, we should do a vaginal exam to look thoroughly to make sure there is no lesions. And we should question you about signs and symptoms of a outbreak that's about to occur. And if we know that you have that happening, then we talk about your mode of delivery. Is the vaginal delivery safe or should we proceed with a C-section? If we find lesions, C-sections is the right way to go mm -hmm. to decrease the transmission rate. Um, as far as HPV, I think you have to have like excessive genital warts for us to consider a different mode of delivery in terms of vaginal versus cesarean, unless it's something that we think you're going to sustain an injury because of the warts then we may talk about a cesarean there. But women deliver with an HPV virus vaginally most of the time. And we're not so worried about the transmission compared to other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. Usually HPV, you know, I don't really think of HPV the same way that I think of other STDs, you know, like chlamydia, for example, you diagnose chlamydia, you treat it with an antibiotic, you screen the partner. HPV is different. Like men can't be screened for that. Um, it can be, it can kind of come and go. Um, your immune system can clear it on its own. We really think of HPV more as like a risk for, you know, can't, developing a cervical Perfect. cancer or genital warts. Usually, I mean, usually I'm not concerned about that passing to the baby. It's, it's, I, I don't think that we think that that can be passed to the baby unless, like Dr. Hill mentioned, you have excessive genital warts and the baby, um, you know, is exposed to that time of birth, which is really uncommon. Um, and then herpes, if you've had herpes prior to pregnancy, it's usually um, very, very rarely ever transmitted to the baby unless you have a lesion and you have a vaginal delivery, that is the one time it's a risk. But if you get a primary outbreak of herpes, meaning you've never had herpes before and you get herpes for the first time during pregnancy, that is a small but um, higher risk of develop of the baby um, having problems from herpes. And so um, if you get a primary outbreak in pregnancy, we do do some antibody testing to figure that out. And then we just kind of let the pediatricians know most babies are not going to have problems, but um, a small percentage of them can. So if you have any new partners or if your partner has herpes and you've never had herpes, um, condom use for sure. And your partner can take um, medication to prevent him from getting a lesion um, while you're pregnant. And we typically start that same medication at 36 weeks in pregnancy with, for people who have a known history of herpes to try to prevent um, outbreaks during delivery. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So um, we talked about Zika as well. If you or if the um, person has been to a country with Zika recently, how long do they need to wait before they try to conceive or do they have to do any sort of testing to ensure that they did not um, transmit Zika while they were out of the country? So there are really specific guidelines for that, depending on the country. And so I would direct you to the CDC website for that. Um, if you just like look up Zika guidelines, travel, pregnancy, you're going to find that um, as like the first thing that comes up. Um, but um, I think it's like up to four months that men can, if they contract Zika, that they can pass that through sperm. Um, and so it just depends on if you're currently pregnant or trying to become pregnant, what the guidelines are, but it's all spelled out kind of in those websites based on where he or she traveled. We're not, we don't usually recommend like just testing for that unless somebody were to have symptoms. Um, Zika testing, I think is a little bit complicated. It's not like the easiest testing to do. Um, but yeah, if you were to have symptoms of like fever, um, that sort of thing, you know, then, then there, are there are tests out there. I think blood and urine tests that can be done. They're just not the easiest um, to perform, so. I agree. Great, thank you. So um, throughout pregnancy, can a woman decide that she want to have a C-section? Could you elect to do that? Is that something that's at the doctor's discretion or is it sort of a, a game time decision when you're um, in the delivery room? 
I'll let you go first. I, I have personal <laughs> opinions there. Yeah, um, I think that's a loaded question, but um, you know, in general, I would not recommend a primary C-section to any woman unless there's a medical indication for that. Um, the C-section is a major surgery. We know that there are higher risks for, certainly for the patient, bleeding, infection, you can have damage to internal organs. Um, you can have pain after a C-section. You can develop infections after a C-section. It's a harder recovery. Um, babies actually do better with a vaginal delivery. Um, something about going through the birth canal, they, it sort of induces like a, a stress response and helps them with breathing afterwards. Um, also, um, it helps with their immune system, like going through the vaginal canal um, gives them some immune protection with healthy bacteria. Um, and yeah, the recovery is just so much easier with a vaginal delivery. Now, that being said, if there are specific concerns that you have about having a vaginal delivery, I would encourage you to talk to your doctor about that. So the reason I said I have personal feelings about this is because American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology will tell me that I'm supposed to allow a woman to say she wants a primary C-section. But I agree with Laura, like there are so many risks that are associated with the primary section. And a woman may not know how many children she wants. And the more C-sections you have, the more complications can occur. So I would personally try to talk a woman down as well. And I would listen in, to her concerns and see if there was something that we could fix through counseling or stretching or different techniques that, you know, warm um, compresses, oils, different things. Because a lot of times it's, women are concerned about the tearing process mm -hmm. and deliveries, but a C-section I think is much more painful than a vaginal laceration. So mm -hmm. I would encourage a vaginal birth. Okay, thank you. So um, when a couple starts to conceive, is there a recommendation how often they should try kind of during the ovulation window? Can you say the end of that again? I did not hear Yeah, it. no, I'm sorry. Um, so when trying to conceive, do you have a recommendation for how often they should, a couple should try during an ovulation window? So I typically tell women if they're tracking their um, ovulation to have sex every other day around the time they're ovulating. I agree with that. You don't have to be having sex every day or twice a day. Sperm are gonna survive for five days approximately. Um, and if other, you're doing activities more frequently, you're going to have more immature sperm that may not know how to get to the egg. Okay, so we talked a lot about different chemicals and um, things to avoid or at least to be cautious of. Is there, do you have recommended resources? Is there, like, I'm sure there's like an app available um, to pregnant women or anyone really, uh, to learn about different cleaning products. Is there anything you can think of off the top of your head or any recommendations? Yeah. Um, I have an app that I, um, use occasionally. It's called Det Detox Me, um, by something called the Silent Spring Institute. It's an awesome app. It uses a lot of stuff from the FDA, but, um, yeah, it's called Detox Me. It's like a blue icon. Um, and it's super detailed. So you can kind of go in there, like you can go to like your diet or cleaning or um, there's all the different kinds of categories and it'll give you a lot of like good um, things that you could try. And keeping in mind, like a lot of this stuff with environmental exposures, like I was saying is we don't always have great data. So I can't always give you like a perfect example of like what I think the real risk is, but I think if you can limit chemical exposure, it's probably for the best. Um, and then the CDC, you know, website and the FDA um, website, those are going to have lots of information as well um, for pregnant patients specifically. I agree. I don't have this app, but I may have to check it out. But I do mm -hmm. frequently look at the CDC and FDA website. Okay, and we can share that resource on the email that we sent out to all of our attendees uh, following the presentation as well. So we will uh, send you a link for that as well. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So um, if somebody's in the preconception stage and they're starting to plan um, pregnancy, are there any certain uh, specialists they should see or uh, their OB-GYN is probably the best first start, I would assume? Yeah, I would say start with your OBGYN. Um, 
And if there are certain specialties, like say, for instance, you have long-standing hypertension, we may want to order EKG, we may want to order echo, but we would refer you to those specialists. We may screen your kidneys, and if we came up with something, we may send you to a nephrologist. So I would start with us, and if you need to see additional specialists, we will direct you. I agree. Great. So we just have a couple more questions if you um, both are okay hanging in there for another moment or two. Um, there are a few questions about um, a woman who is maybe having some difficulty conceiving. So the first would be, are there any concerns for a woman who is trying to get pregnant whose mother uh, may have had some difficulty conceiving? I would say it, it, it just really depends on the scenario. Um, and there's so many reasons that somebody can have difficulty conceiving and if you just go in and have a conversation with your OBGYN, they can pro probably just with history and physical exam alone, they're going to have a pretty good idea of what might be going on. And there's some blood work that we can do that will be helpful. Um, there's definitely certain conditions that if a, a woman's mother was having difficulty conceiving, that could be a similar thing. So like polycystic ovarian syndrome, as an example, is one that might run in families or endometriosis. Um, but just because your mother had trouble or didn't have trouble doesn't mean that you are going to have the same experience. I agree. And also um, when you visit with us and discuss with us, we may talk to you about testing your partner as well and making sure your partner's sperm is okay too. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it's not us. Sometimes it's him or mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you are someone who's having difficulty conceiving, are there recommended vitamins or the recommended um, any kind of fertility boosting resources that a woman should be? Um, so I think that would depend on the reason why you're experiencing infertility. So that's mm -hmm. something I think you would have to personally meet with your OBGYN and we try to pinpoint what the problem is and then make recommendations based on what the issue is. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. I think, you know, if you're trying to conceive, even if you're having difficulty, just take a prenatal vitamin, but, um, you know, rare, very rarely is it going to be some sort of vitamin deficiency while you're not getting pregnant. It's probably something different. Um, so again, I would just kind of direct you to talk to your OBGYN, but you don't need to go and take like 20 supplements to try to improve your fertility. It's probably, um, probably not super helpful if you're just taking a regular prenatal vitamin, that's all you need. Okay. And a couple of women are wondering if there are some first signs of pregnancy that are, um, you know, obvious signs that you may be pregnant? Are there things to look for um, that can kind of tell you before the test does? So a lot of women experience nipple tenderness early on, um, nausea and vomiting, sleep or fatigue, they're tired all the time. Um, some women will skip their period or miss their period or it may be lighter or they may just spot. Yeah, I'd agree. <laughs> okay, and can you just touch briefly on what it, how it might impact the baby if you are pre-diabetic or diabetic uh, before you conceive? So um, there was a slide I had up there on how it could affect the baby, but, um, so with diabetes, especially poorly controlled diabetes, we really worry about like um, neural tube defects. So problems with the baby forming. So we like for you to really get the hemoglobin A1C into a normal range um, prior to conceiving for that. We also know that growth restriction or large babies, it can happen both ways. The baby can be really, really big leading to shoulder dystocias or C-sections, or the baby could be small. When the baby's born, if your sugar's not controlled, they have problems regulating their sugars. They can end up in the NICU. They can have jaundice and electrolyte imbalances. So it's, it's really best if we get you optimally, sorry, my dog is trying to get in the screen, optimally controlled prior to um, conceiving. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, definitely people with like type one diabetes. If you have type one diabetes, it's really important, I would say, to have a preconception visit with the OBGYN to make sure that your diabetes is well controlled prior to pregnancy, because that is a very risky. Um, there are a lot of pregnancy complications that can happen with type one diabetes. Not to say that you can't have a totally healthy pregnancy. It just requires a lot of close um, monitoring. Um, if you have type two diabetes, say you have type two diabetes and you're just on metformin or you have like, um, like you mentioned, like pre-diabetes, like maybe some insulin resistance, um, you know, that does not have as high of a risk of things like miscarriage or fetal anomalies that somebody with sugars in the three or four hundreds would have. Um, but definitely are a lot more increased risk of gestational diabetes um, or worsening type two diabetes during pregnancy. You become a lot more resistant to insulin during pregnancy. Um, and so if you have like prediabetes or diabetes prior to pregnancy, we're going to check on all that during the first trimester. And, um, you may need to start insulin. Like, even if you were never on insulin prior to pregnancy, um, you're probably going to need it during pregnancy because that placenta is really working against you and making you more resistant to insulin. And so pregnant women tend to need really high doses of insulin. And then as soon as the baby's born, it gets a lot better. Um, but that's kind of where you're going back to like lifestyle stuff, trying to like improve your fitness and nutrition and, and optimizing weight prior to pregnancy to, um, you know, help fix some of those things before you're pregnant. So cool. Okay. Awesome. Thank you both so much. You stayed an extra 20 minutes, um, answering all of these questions and thank you to all of our participants for sharing your questions. Um, if we, we have a couple other questions that talk about some uh, pelvic floor exercises and things along those lines. So any resources we have um, we will definitely share in the email that will, um, you know, help give you some more information about preconception. So thank you so much to Dr. Downing and Dr. Hill. Again, they um, both are accepting new patients and um, I will share their contact information in our email. And if you are um, not living anywhere near their locations, then we will also share our link to our OBGYN special, uh, specialty page where you can find all of our different um, practice location. So again, thank you both so much. Thank you to everyone for participating. Yeah. And thank you, uh, guys. yeah, thank you so much. Have a good thank evening, you. everyone. I hope you all Bye. have a good night. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye.